We are your destination through the season and through the off season here on our USC channel. Courtesy, this guy, Matt Zemek, Trojans Wire. Without him, we don't have a show. Here we are, USC Live every Monday night. Mark it down, put it somewhere where you will remember it to show up on time, 8 p.m. Pacific time, each and every Monday night. Matt, how you doing tonight? Doing well, Mark. Uh, in, in, you know, interesting to talk about recruiting after, you know, what used to be the big day, but now, quote unquote, National Signing Day is such an afterthought. Uh, so much of this is in December and also, of course, the transfer portal as well. It's just striking how diluted National Signing Day uh, has become in, in the current era. There is so much talk out there among a lot of people, and some of those people are assistant coaches or possibly head coaches that with the transfer portal added onto this. So I believe this is the fifth recruiting cycle. Correct me if I'm wrong of the early signing period in December. I believe this is the fifth cycle, something in that range. I might be in that range here. Yeah. Um, what wasn't occurring at that point was all this activity in the transfer portal. So now coaching staffs may have to deal with a conference championship game after the season. They, 80 some of those staffs out of 131 teams have to deal with a postseason game to ready their team throughout December. They have to deal with the early now what has become the National Signing Day, roughly December 15th. They have to deal with the transfer portal. They have to deal with retaining their own players from entering the transfer portal. It just seems like an onslaught of activity for these coaching staffs to have to deal with in December. Yeah. And uh, you know, like they're, they're supposed to be coaching their teams and you have all this recruiting activity. And of course, really the, the I think the main problem I have with uh, the early signing period is just that's carousel season, you know, that that's when coaches are being hired and fired. And so you have, you're putting schools in a position where, they have to make a move right away instead of being able to wait three weeks and and choose. And imagine if we had National Signing Day, you know, in February, we didn't have the early signing period. Schools could then take their time and vet candidates and and maybe not hand out absurdly large buyouts as well. Like this is a real thing in terms of why they're, the buyouts are so uh, enormous, why contracts are so out of balance. Like there's an economic sanity component to the argument that we should go back to the true national signing day and not have this early signing period um, because the, the schools will hire a coach quickly and and agents will, you know, put the knife to the 80s throat uh, saying, hey, you know, if you if you want to get my coach uh, in the door, you, you know, you better pony up and you better get make it a coach friendly contract. Like that's not healthy for anybody. That's not health. I mean, it's healthy for uh, the agents and the coaches, but not for anybody else. And actually, even for the coaches, like just to just throw them onto the recruiting trail in December, uh, you know, you have oh, you have to retain this recruit. You have to retain this class uh, in like five, seven, ten days. Like that's madness. That's insanity. And we should certainly have a, a situation where. We have the carousel season. You know, December is for coaching transactions. It's for these coaches to get their houses houses in order in terms of where they're going to be employed. You know, with their families, with their kids. Uh, you know, what who they're going to work for, who they want to work for. You know, like that should be the time when they shop on the open market and they and they make decisions about where they want to go. And you throw the early signing period in the middle, in the middle of all that. It's just it just doesn't make sense. So that really is the thing about why we should go back to National Signing Day in February because you just can't put 10 trillion different things on a coach and coaching staff's plate in December. It should be carousel, get your job situated, and then you know by, by the time the holidays arrive, then you can tr transition to, all right, now I'm going to recruit for the next several weeks. Like January is recruiting month. You know, that would be a sane structure. This this just isn't. Now, I mean, you know, for bloggers such as myself, like this means more activity, you know, more intrigue uh, throughout the year. But, you know, what's good for me and what's good for a blogger is not what's good for college football. 
uh, you could you could find a lot of different topics that fit into that particular box. Now, I'm going to extend your points with a little bit more sympathy toward um, this last offseason, not what we're experiencing right now, but post uh, December of 2021 toward uh, Notre Dame, Oklahoma, Oregon, because they didn't just have to change coaches. They didn't have those couple weeks leading into it thinking, okay, we may be dismissing this coach and we can at least line up candidates and get our ducks in order. Their coach hit the door and we're gone. So take Dan Lanning, for example. I'm not going to uh, step on the toes of the audience and use another example. I'll use the Dan Lanning example with Oregon. He's still coaching a defense in Georgia certainly received a lot of help. They won a national championship and again, received a lot of help. But in regards to the recruiting to extend on Matt's point of the five to 10 day window of trying to retain a class for him, especially and some other examples, he travels across country. So I don't know how many of those, and I know that he really still continue to try to pull players out of the Southeast and go to where he was familiar, but still you're talking about, relationships that have been built with recruits for anywhere from six months to two years. And then a new coach and new coaching staff comes in. They may not have recruited that particular player at another, especially with a lot of these coaches that are coming up through the group of five ranks and they, they land a big power five job. They're not recruiting the same level of players. And suddenly they have to try to retain this player and build a relationship and, and sell them on the school and the football program in less than two weeks. Yeah, I mean, you're being asked to juggle like, you know, seven, eight different uh, things at the same time. And I mean, you know, so look, we know that coaches get paid very handsomely, but, you know, in, in terms of, you know, you're expected to do a lot. You're expected to have a lot of different roles and responsibilities. Let's let's say that you can't do all your roles and responsibilities extremely well to the best possible extent when they're all thrust on you on, at the same time. Uh, during the same week, you know, there, there is a difference there. Like, he, you know, you could be Superman, you could be Clark Kent. And, you know, and, and yet if you're told to do eight different things in the span of uh, 48, 72 hours, nobody can do that. Nobody can do it, you know, fully attentively. Like there are only so many hours in a day. And, you know, in terms of work culture and work expectations, like we shouldn't be asking coaches we shouldn't be asking anyone to you know work 21 hour days and you know totally neglect your sleep your health like th th there's there's nothing noble there's nothing honorable about that so you know we shouldn't be asking coaches we shouldn't be asking any workers in any endeavor any profession any industry to have to do like eight or nine different things in 48 hours uh, yeah, like that just doesn't make sense. And yet that's what Dan Lang had to do in December, 2021, when he came aboard, it's what Kirby smart has to do uh, frequently. It's what Nick Saban has to do. And I mean, they're good at their jobs, but like we, we that doesn't mean, you know, Oh, just, let's just heap stuff on your plate. Uh, you know, it's like the, I love Lucy episode where she, she's on the conveyor belt with the chocolates Classic. trying to wrap everything, you know, just, just it, it's, it's just too much all at once let's let, let, we can spread this thing out like you know if you're only if you only have to do two or three things it, it, per per week you know then you can really focus in on those things and here's the other thing mark that if you're doing only two or three things instead of eight or nine things at once we can get a better feel for how good you are as a coach or how good you are as a practitioner like that's the other thing in terms of evaluating coaches what how how different would the landscape be and maybe some coaches that currently deliver relatively mediocre results if we changed some of these structural dynamics would we see some coaches which are have struggled to gain traction in recent seasons would we see significant different differences in performance and results very intriguing question um to unpack to unpack and to uh, really explore in deeper detail. But of course, we won't know the answer unless uh, we do see a, a return to the old recruiting calendar, the old National Signing Day. 
You know, Matt, that's my defense for churning out mediocre content, as I say. You know, I'm running 15 <laughs> channels, and it's like a conveyor belt. So, you know, give me a break. Uh, yeah. Same for a blogger. You know, we're got to gotta get those eight posts a day. And, like, you're not going to write, uh, you know, write Thompson, Dan Jenkins uh, in most of those posts. Yeah, you, you are you are the hamster on the treadmill. So, yeah, you know, you know the feeling in a, in a broadcast sense. I know it in terms of my writing. Folks, we're going to extend on a point that Matt's hit on regarding recruiting here. But before we do that, a couple of programming notes, folks. We had Tony Altimore on the main channel earlier tonight. Another fascinating discussion concerning the landscape of college football, how it impacts the Pac-12 and all the conferences, what could be the strategies and the moves that are forthcoming in regards to expansion and realignment. Again, that's with Tony Altimore. You can find that on the main channel. If you have trouble, well, I can't imagine. If you put in Voice of College Football on YouTube, I think I pop up first, or just markrogerstv.com redirects you right to the front YouTube page. And also, uh, we released our pre-spring practice uh, top 25. So it's not the way too early top 25 that everybody else released about a month ago, but I guess it's the um, still too early top 25. And you can see where we placed uh, USC I would think most people would be pretty happy where I placed USC. But back to this discussion, Matt, about recruiting, um, I surveyed a lot of the comments that came into the channel uh, over this past week, and there were some concerns that people had. Dan Lanning did pull in a nice class at Oregon that outranked USC's class. If all you're doing is going recruiting rankings, you know, who's better than us? And uh, I'm not happy with that. I'm USC fan, and we need to be number one in the Pac-12, if not higher than that even. So, you know, your evaluation of the USC class, what were some of the objectives where they met versus what uh, Dan Lanning's doing at Oregon? And, of course, he's not going to be the competition, and most of these players' careers are not going to be played in competition against the Pac-12 and Dan Lanning, but against, of course, the Big Ten. Well, you know, it was great to see Harbor go to USC. Oh, wait a minute. That's South Carolina. That's the other USC. Uh, in terms of this recruiting landscape and just comparing USC and Oregon, I mean, the difference is defense, right? Roderick Pleasant goes to uh, Oregon and not USC. And I, and I think that that's the issue for USC. It's not really a holistic, pervasive recruiting issue or problem relative to Oregon or, or relative to uh, the national scene. It's offense versus defense. Like, I mean, you could be the biggest Lincoln Riley hater, critic, whatever, but tell me, tell me where the weakness is on USC's offense <laughs> heading into 2023. You you cannot find a weakness on the USC offense. Got offensive linemen, depth at running back, depth at wide receiver, Caleb, and now you add Walker Lyons, you know, and getting him over and against Utah uh, and BYU. I mean, USC is loaded, deep, stacked uh, at just about every position. Justin Dietrich coming back. So you have two deep quality at each of the five offensive line positions. The, the offensive line is definitely a lot deeper uh, than it was uh, going into last season. I mean, the offensive recruiting portal retention, that whole piece on the offensive side of the ball, that is a complete offense. And I'm not just talking about run versus pass. I'm talking about addressing depth and quality at all the position groups. USC is there. USC is set on offense. It's really on defense where you miss Roderick Pleasant. You don't get Harbor. He goes to the other USC for Shane Beamer in Columbia, South Carolina. You know, there is a real question about recruits wanting to play for an Alex Grinch defense. I mean, that is a legitimate concern. That's a legitimate talking point. It's going to it's gonna hang over USC uh, throughout the offseason. Now, of course, you're getting another transfer portal window uh, in the spring. You know, obviously, Jordan Addison came to USC in that spring portal window last season. USC is going to need a, another really big couple of defensive transfer portal additions because, I, I you know, I don't think it's all there. Uh, on, on defense, I think the linebacker room. I know Tim Prangley has talked about this with Mason Cobb uh, and uh, Tackett Curtis coming in. You know, a transfer and a recruit. You know, both the best of the best, top end, 
Like there's no question that USC's linebacker room is really good, but that still leaves D line and the secondary. And that's where Roderick Pleasant, that like that really stings that, you know, in terms of what Oregon and Dan Lanning were able to do relative to Lincoln Riley, Alex Grinch and USC. So it's not a pervasive holistic thing. I think that's the thing that should make USC fans feel somewhat reassured that, you know, people want to play for Lincoln Riley's offense. It's do I want to play for a Lincoln Riley slash Alex Grinch uh, defense? So it's a very specific targeted thing. And and so in 2023, either Alex Grinch gets the job done or he's out of here. And so one way or another, there will be some degree of resolution such that I think USC in 2024 and beyond, uh, one should expect the, the defensive recruiting uh, to pick up. Uh, but, uh, but right now, certainly heading into 2023, it is a question mark and it is a legitimate point of concern. So like USC fans shouldn't feel, you know, really severely concerned about recruiting because I think the, the, the defensive situation, it's going to be resolved one way or another, either positively or negatively this year. And of course, you know, just around the bend, we have the 12 team playoff in 2024. And we, you know, we talked a little bit about this, Mark, last week here at the Voice of College Football, that with the schedule being what it is, if USC goes 10 and 2, uh, you know, doesn't make the playoff, but makes the, the Pac-12 championship game, that's a that's a that's a pretty good season given the schedule, which is just a beast. I mean, it, it it's a beast, it is what it is, and the program doesn't yet have the depth on defense that it really needs to be at the at the very top level where you expect 11 and 1 against a schedule such as what USC has. I don't think the Trojans are quite there. 10 and 2 would really be good work in 2023, but that that probably won't uh, lead to a playoff berth. And so in many ways, I, I think it, it for USC fans, USC fans have to wrestle with just this reality that, you know, we might need to wait one more year for the playoff. And of course, in 2024, like if USC is not making a 12 team playoff, then, then that's a five alarm fire. I mean, we, we would all agree with that. Like you, there should be zero question that USC should be in the 12 team playoff every year without question, zero doubt, you know, it should be an automatic thing. But for one more year in 2023, with the four team set up, the defensive depth not being entirely there relative to Oregon, relative to Utah, uh, the other uh, stalwart programs in the Pac-12. You know, it, it, it's a very inconvenient conversation. I think, a, I mean, a good one, but like getting a finite answer uh, on that is, is going to divide the USC fan base because a lot of fans will say, wow, you know, 10 and 2 against this schedule, that really wouldn't be all that bad. And then you'll get another large contingent of USC fans reasonably saying, hey, you know, we, we expected playoff berths by year two. And we expected to be right in the hunt for the national championship. And, you know, Alex Grinch is a drag on the program. And, you know, Lincoln Riley is settling for second best. I mean, that that is a valid critique. Like, why the hell didn't you get Jim Leonard? Why didn't you fire Alex Grinch, kick him to the curb and bring in an elite defensive coordinator, a proven defensive coordinator. Like that is a valid line of argument. And, and Lincoln Riley is sticking to his methods, being stubborn, uh, you know, as we covered on the Riley files with our Oklahoma insider and, and you know, the, the loyalty that Lincoln Riley exhibited to a lot of people at Oklahoma when that loyalty probably wasn't fully merited. So you have this push and pull, you have this tug of war between two very legitimate points of thought. Like I'm not going to say that, USC fans expecting a playoff berth in 2023 are the unrealistic people in the room. Not going to go there, but I'm also not going to say that it, the fans who think 10 and two is a really good season uh, against this schedule. I'm not going to say that, you know, they're settling uh, because there are larger realities at work here. And the biggest reality at work here is Alex Grinch is still employed. When evaluating a head coach, I certainly look at a number of factors depending on the length of time we're talking about as well. Sure. It starts with record. That's the first thing I want to know. Okay. What was his record this year? Well, we, we start there, but you know, and especially uh, this isn't uh, Lincoln Riley's place right now with USC because he elevated them to a conference championship game and a new year six bowl. But with a lot of coaches, you know, you will see teams that go eight and four and it is clear 
that they just played well enough to beat all the teams that they were supposed to beat on the schedule, and they are nowhere near the upper echelon of that particular conference because they are getting their brains beat in three or four times a year. Then you have eight and four teams that look the part, like they're close. And, you know, they're testing the upper echelon of the conference. So there, there's a lot that goes into the evaluation, even, of course, well beyond that. So it's it shouldn't be, folks. Uh, many of you will just simply be playoffs or bust. If we go to the playoffs this year, that's a success. If we don't, that's all there is to it. And yes, over the course of time, if, if this program is not, especially with the 12-team, uh, playoff not going to playoffs consistently that's that's going to be a very bottom line uh, evaluation in the long run for this program with 12 teams making the playoffs but for any particular season especially year two I wouldn't just slice it at made the playoffs great season although that's going to be difficult to slice any other way of course if they make the playoffs you know, job accomplished, regardless of what happens in the playoff versus they missed the playoffs. Oh, well, they failed. Yeah. And, you know, the the nuance to bring up again with the schedule in case people missed our show last week on the voice of college football. The fact that USC is sitting there with, you know, a, a week off in late November, that is an unrealized benefit. And I made the analogy last week that the Pac-12 is basically saying we'll give you free annual memberships at the health club usc but first need to eat 20 cheeseburgers in two hours like that that that's really the deal that if usc could get through the the grind of the 12 game regular season and the grind of playing those nine straight weeks week four through week 12 then and 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 can get to the pac-12 title game then that week off in late november becomes an actual benefit but it, the, the USC doesn't derive the benefit unless it gets the plane ticket to Vegas. So, you know, so 10 and two with a loss to Notre Dame, but eight and one in the Pac 12, getting the berth in the Pac 12 championship game. Like, you know, that, that USC, if it gets to Vegas, has the advantage because it gets the off week. You know, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Oregon State, any of those other four teams. They will have played a game, and, all, and moreover, they will have played a rivalry game. And the other nuance here is, you know, okay, Oregon, Oregon State, that's going to be a tough game while USC has that late November week off. Washington, Washington State, Apple Cup, that's going to be a tough game for the Huskies while USC has the week off. This year, Utah, Colorado is not going to be a walk in the park for the Utes the way it was last year leading into the Pac-12 championship game. And, you know, if you want to play Colorado this year, if you want to play Deion Sanders' team this year, you want to get them early. And, and admittedly, USC does get a little bit of a benefit there playing Colorado early rather than late. By the time we get into Thanksgiving weekend, you know, you would think that Dion will have learned a few things at Colorado. His players will have understood a little bit more about what it takes. And so by that point in the season, they might be able to give Utah much more of a game than they would uh, early in the season. But anyway, USC doesn't derive the benefit of that late November week off unless it gets to Vegas. And so it just I say that to magnify the point that if it's a 10 and 2 12 game season and it get and USC is able to get to Vegas, USC will have an advantage over any of its opponents in the Pac-12 championship game. Lincoln Riley will have 2 weeks to look at film. He'll be able to look at the different opponents and what they bring to the table. And, you know, you give Lincoln Riley an extra week to prepare as an offensive tactician, that, that's a significant check mark. And, a pretty, and if USC has any moderate health concerns, getting that week off, uh, you know, should alleviate them, should put the Trojans in a better position uh, to perform. You know, imagine if Andrew Voorhees had a week off heading into the Pac-12 championship game uh, against Utah. You know, if he had if he had a little bit more of a cushion. Um, you know, that that could have really changed the equation. So USC, if it get if it goes 10 and two, that's not a playoff season, but it could set up the Trojans really well to win the Pac-12 championship. And if you win the Pac-12 championship this year, you know, in, the, in 2021, the Pac-12 wasn't good. You know, Anthony Brown was a quarterback on the Pac-12 championship in, in the Pac-12 championship game. 
and Utah just ran him and, and the Ducks out of Las Vegas. Uh, game was never close. You, and, of course, Utah crushed Oregon twice in a span of a few weeks that season. Like, the Pac-12 just you know wasn't very good in 2021. The Pac-12 that we're going to see in 2023 – might not be a great conference, but you certainly have several teams that enter the season as, you know, you know they're going to be good. We don't know they're going to be great, but we know they're going to be good. It's been a long time since we've had a Pac-12 where you enter the season knowing that several teams are going to be top quality. Because because entering this, this past 2022 season, people th- thought, okay, USC could be really good. Oregon could be really good. People weren't expecting Washington uh, to be really good. Utah really was the consensus choice as conference champion. Um, People expected UCLA to win eight or nine games, but that was partly because of the cupcake schedule. Uh, You know, all the home games, all the the easy non-conference games. Uh, People weren't necessarily expecting UCLA to be an especially good team. And, you know, UCLA did peter out. But that's still a nine-win team, came really close to winning 10 games, uh, thoroughly defeated Utah, thoroughly outplayed Utah uh, head-to-head. And Washington. Yeah, and also Washington. And then, of course, Oregon State won 10 games without a quarterback. Uh, so, like, we, But we didn't know those things going into 2022. Uh, several Pac-12 teams overachieved relative to preseason expectations, USC being one of them because, again, USC was expected to be a 9-3 and three team. And it won 11 games. Uh, so even though it, you know, there was the implosion against Tulane uh, in the Cotton Bowl, still USC definitely exceeded uh, the preseason expectations for year one. So going into 2023, though, there's not really a, a whole lot of, oh, well, this team might be good. No, it's Oregon's going to be good. Washington's going to be good. Utah's going to be good. USC is going to be good. Oregon State probably is going to be good. I mean, five teams that are going to be expected to win at least nine games. Expected to win nine. Not maybe win nine, expected to win nine. And you have have to go back uh, several years to find another Pac-12 preseason or Pac-12 offseason when that was the case. So if USC can deal with that Pac-12 and get to the championship game and then, of course, win it with that week off, that that, uh, currently unrealized benefit that could become – an actualized benefit if it gets to Vegas. Uh, that's really good work. That's a really good result if USC can pull it off. And so if it doesn't, uh, if it's not accompanied by a playoff berth, you know, that is just an inconvenient uh, truth uh, about this coming USC season. Matt Zemek, Trojans Wire. Get on over there to Trojans Wire. Check out Matt's work. Uh, Matt, hold that thought and that evaluation on the Pac-12. I've got a question for you. Let's hit a couple items here real quick i posted a comment by andrew uh, pinto andrew follows me on twitter he tags me on practically everything so i'm not complaining about that andrew it's just nice to see you here on the usc show he's an arizona fan tags me on just about everything and i should probably produce uh an arizona video just for andrew because he's constantly poking me about arizona arizona's on the rise they're coming Oh, well, Andrew, I mean, Arizona could be a number two seed in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> so that, that's pretty good. I mean, I'm not sleeping on Arizona. Like, uh, you know, Tabellis, he, he dropped 40 on Oregon uh, Thursday night. He's a beast in the low post. I'm not sleeping on Arizona. Somebody else had uh, inquired about Alex Grinch's recruiting at Oklahoma. This is what I would do. Now, I just pulled up the 2020 class. This is just, I just randomly, bam, just let's pull up the 2020 class. I would do two things to evaluate Alex Grinch's class just to get a a feel for it. Uh, I lost track of who asked that in particular. You go to every Oklahoma class. You look at the overall ranking. Okay, they had the sixth best recruiting class in the nation. Okay, that tells you something, but obviously we can assume that they were a little heavy on the offensive side. So for this 2020 class, They were uh, 13th in the nation, and the top two players were offensive players, and the top six, whoa, seven, eight, the top eight out of nine players, offensive players for Oklahoma in that particular class. 
pre- it, it it flows with what we've seen in this recruiting cycle, does it not? That you know, it, like Lincoln Riley has no problem getting the offensive uh, studs into the stable. You know, very top of the line. You really can't get any better. And then on defense, you don't have that same kind of pull. You don't have that same kind of traction. So like that, that certainly checks out. And and this is like this is a long running thing. I mean, not uh, not decades long, but like you know, it's four years now. Four years that we've had uh, the Lincoln Riley Alex Grinch show uh, as a tag team uh, tandem. And so you know, when things keep repeating like this, like that is that's a trend. Like it's not an accident. And with each subsequent reiteration of it, it becomes less and less of a coincidence and more and more of just uh, a plain pattern that you can see in the light of day. So, I mean, there's only so much to say when the results are what they are and they've been what they have been and you don't really see a significant uh, change in the trajectory. Tim, we appreciate uh, you encouraging everyone to hit the like button. And subscribe right here at the Voice of College Football. We've got our USC show with Matt each and every Monday at 8 Pacific time. Please subscribe. And also, folks, um, with about 65 on the line, keep in mind, you can always go out there and you are in connection and contact with people that don't know that we are here talking USC football every week. So you can let them know that we are here and bring them in for us. So thank you for doing that. So along the lines of where you were in evaluating the conference, Matt, I don't know if you've really given this thought across the board. Here's my perspective on where the Pac-12 stands. Like you, I thought it was a remarkable year and upgrade for the Pac-12. I don't think there's any question about that. The biggest detractor at the Pac-12 cannot deny that this was a really good league, exciting, and a quality league, especially the top five to six. It was six, really. That, that played good football and were legitimate top 15 to 20 teams in the country. Okay. Um, I came into the uh, 22 season, of course, with a certain evaluation and expectation. Uh, once we got through the regular season, I had the SEC here. I had the ACC probably here at, at the bottom. And I didn't know about the other three. Uh The Big 12 showed me not to be quite as good as the other two. I would put them in fourth place, and I have a difficult time separating the Big 10 and the Pac-12. They're very different leagues, but uh, in terms of how good they are, I do believe that the Big 10 is probably better. I I, I think it's better, but it didn't necessarily perform better on the field. You could match all sorts of results and come up with, with different narratives between the two conferences. That, that's kind of my take. SEC, probably Big Ten, but right there, the Pac-12, and then the Big 12 in fourth place, and the ACC just got um, annihilated again in regards to win-loss record against the rest of the Power Five. Yeah, uh, you know, in terms of the conference uh, power question heading into 2023, I think that Florida State and Wisconsin, Florida State and the ACC, Wisconsin under Luke Fickle, in the Big Ten, what those two programs do, that's gonna those are those two schools are gonna play significant roles in reshifting, or at least you know just <clears throat> just affecting uh, the, the the balance of power in terms of the conferences uh, in in college football. In terms of evaluating twenty twenty two, the big problem for the Pac twelve well it was the bowl, it was the high end bowl games you know USC. Uh, not being able to beat Tulane and also Utah getting its blows, its doors blown off by Penn State and and Utah, you know the Pac-12 champion, two years running. When when the when the champion of your conference loses at the beginning of the year to Florida and at the end of the season to Penn State, you know that is that certainly puts a you know it was a great year, but sentiment uh, to, to the conversation table. So, you know, th- that Utah-Florida game and also Utah-Baylor, Utah starting its 2023 season uh, with two significant, notable tests, uh, the Utes need to go 2-0. and uh, Not to put too much pressure on uh, Utah, but, you know, just in terms of the Pac-12's reputation, uh, there's going to be a yeah, but uh, argument the whole season if Utah loses one of those uh, first two games. And, I mean, you know, Utah kicked USC's butt in the Pac-12 championship game, you know, just throw them around like a dirty old rag and, 
And yet then you go to the, to Pasadena and you lose to a Penn state team that was handled by Ohio state and especially Michigan. Uh, you know, Penn state was competitive into the early fourth quarter uh, against Ohio state at home, but Michigan destroyed Penn state at the line of scrimmage, you know, throughout that game in Ann Arbor. So, you know, uh, that, that collection of results that Utah was so much better than USC and yet, couldn't solve Anthony Richardson in Florida, couldn't solve Penn State. Uh, you know, that is that is an uncomfortable reality uh, connected to the Pac-12. And it, But it's interesting, Mark, that the Pac-12 bowl season ended with a thud. Uh, you figure that the Pac- this was the Pac-12's year to have a winning bowl season and also to win some high-end bowl games. Didn't happen that way. Finished with a three and four bowl record. Most years when the Pac-12 does, you know, step on a rake in bowl season, because that that's that's the normal scenario. Most years people would be saying, well, same old Pac-12. Pac-12 did it again. Pac-12, uh, you know, took a took a good situation and managed to turn it into a failure. Just like just like always. We're not really hearing that narrative in the off season, And we're hearing it and we're not hearing it because Bo Nix, Michael Penix, Caleb Williams, Cam Rising, just the retention of quarterbacks, the retention of high-end quality centerpiece players is so pervasive throughout the conference. You then add what Dan Lanning is doing in recruiting uh, at Oregon. Uh, you add what USC is able to do every year under Lincoln Riley in the transfer portal because, like, that is a that's a regular thing. Like, it should always be expected that Lincoln Riley is going to clean up uh, in the transfer portal. Uh, recruiting, you know, again, we've, we've, we've gone over the defensive piece of that. Um, but USC in the portal just always gets rock stars and will continue to get rock stars. Uh, so, you know, because of roster construction and player retention, um, we're not hearing the negative narratives surrounding the PAC 12. And that to me is really the, the telltale sign that this conference is headed for a very compelling, uh, 2023 season in which the conference is going to be respected throughout the season. And, and it's not going to come as a shock. Like that's the other thing that, that I think plenty of people were caught off guard by how competitive uh, and deep the PAC 12 was in 2022. I don't think anyone's going to get caught off guard in 2023. There's actually a built-in expectation of quality. And that, that is just a very rare thing relative to the PAC 12. Look at this. In two nights, that would be Wednesday night. We've got another Pac-12 live chat show featuring Tony, Chris, Rick, and Tim. Look at that on the main channel on Wednesday at 10.30 Eastern at 7.30 Pacific. And uh, it'll be right here on the USC channel as well. Uh, I didn't even know that that was coming up. So these guys, they just kind of, they they just run wild and, and post shows whenever they want. But I am very appreciative of that. That's a good thing. So... That should be a whole lot of fun. The Pac-12 show is phenomenal, folks. So you get uh, an off-season edition here on Wednesday coming up in two nights with our Pac-12 contingent that we're going to have to do something about here uh, in less than two years. <laughs> in about a year and a uh, In about a year, yes. As, uh, it will turn into a Big Ten show, I guess. I don't know what we're going to do, but uh, we'll figure that out when the time comes. All right. Um, Bart says, with uh, USC's inability to attract defensive linemen, sounds like Tackett Curtis will be busy. <laughs> he will be. And, yeah, it does bring up a good point that when we, I mean, and and Mark, I remember you saying this about Bryson Shaw, that he was one of the leading tacklers, uh, you know, coming into uh, USC, you know, from his days at Ohio State. And, if you're a leading tackler and you're in the secondary, that's not necessarily a good thing. It means that the layers of defense in front of you aren't doing their job. And so th that's how uh, just raw numbers of tackles can be a very uh, misleading statistic. You know, it, it, it can actually point to the wrong indicators as opposed to pure natural excellence or uh, athletic ability. So like that is something to keep in mind. And, and yeah, like, in the in the uh, Cotton Bowl against Tulane, like Tuli Tui Pelotu didn't have really a huge impact. He had that one sack late in the game, which you know Tulane was able to overcome. Uh, but like it, you know, he did not have help 
on that defensive line. You had other players such as Solomon Bird and Tyrone Teleni making the occasional important play, and it was enough uh, against a number of the Pac-12's more mediocre uh, teams, mediocre offenses. But, you know, against the big boys, uh, just just plainly not good enough. And, and I think it's pretty clear that USC does not have the defensive line quality or depth to really inspire total confidence and trust uh, heading into 2023, especially with, you know, USC now has to play Oregon and Washington, which it didn't have to in 2022. And you have all these quarterbacks coming back and, you know, it's just going to be a real challenge. It's also going to be like, this is, this is where USC has to be a lot better. And that is Eric, like players such as Eric Gentry getting much stronger physically much tougher like they need to be hitting the weight room they need to come into uh august camp and and week one being much more physically developed players because as uh, larry pilgrim mentioned on our coverage of the pac-12 championship game that you, you know utah was able to just grind gentry down in a fine powder that gentry was not ready for the physical punishing style that utah brought to the table so if usc is going to stand up to utah if usc is going to stand up to a really good Washington offensive line when the Huskies uh, come to the Coliseum in early November, the, the, the players that have were in the program in 2022 and are coming back for 2023, they need to be so much stronger uh, than they were. And so that's where we also get into another uh, Lincoln Riley hire part of his team. Another guy he's shown a lot of loyalty to Benny Wiley, the USC strength coach, he, you know, he, he is definitely uh, under the gun, I would say, uh, heading into 2023, not just Alex Grinch, because if USC gets pulverized again, if USC gets mashed uh, again, we really have to ask if Benny Wiley is the strength coach that Lincoln Riley should have. And, and there are plenty of Oklahoma fans uh, and Oklahoma journalists who would uh, be very quick to affirm that point. It's a position that uh, serious college football fans know the importance of, but most of college football nation kind of bypasses and just thinks offense, defense, special teams, and that's what it is. But obviously it's a very physical sport, and uh, that strength and conditioning coach, he is vital. I just posted this, just came to mind as we were talking about Alex Grinch and his 22 season, just Point blank, everyone, if you'd like to take part in the poll, I just simply asked, should Alex Grinch have been fired? So with no and, conditions, there you go. Yeah. And I think, and I think, you know, the real nuance there is, you know, if you could have, if you could have lined up a deal for Jim Leonard uh, and, and that would, would, would have been the end product of firing Alex Grinch, then yes. But <laughs> sure. if just firing Alex Grinch and not knowing who the heck you're going to replace him with, uh, that, that, that's another matter entirely. Uh, hey, Mark, and I know this is a USC show, but let's mention the fact that we have Miami and Notre Dame both looking for offensive coordinators right mm -hmm. now. And so, I mean, certainly, so like there is a USC tie in just if, you know, just looking at Notre Dame uh, because like if, if you already have Sam Hartman as the quarterback at Notre Dame for this season, USC is going to have to face Sam Hartman uh, on October 14th, the mid October Saturday in South Bend. Well, I sure hope you don't have Dan Mullen coaching uh, Sam Hartman that, that like that would be a, a scenario USC fans certainly want to avoid. And one has to just wonder uh, and I'm sure USC fans are wondering this, you know, is there a, is there a battle? Is there a tug of war between Marcus Freeman and Mario Cristobal for Dan Mullen? I don't know, but like that, that is certainly something, uh, worth following. And, and frankly, uh, I, if I'm a Notre Dame fan, I, I'm secretly excited. Like I'm thinking, okay, this is a chance to upgrade an offensive coordinator, I wouldn't necessarily call Tommy Reese a bad offensive coordinator, but a lot like Alex Grinch, you you, you would not call him an elite coordinator. Uh, and so you could, there is certainly room to do better. And, and like Dan Mullen uh, is, is at the top of the list in terms of uh, available offensive coordinators. I don't know if he wants to go to South Bend. I don't know if he wants to go to Coral Gables in the U, but uh, that is certainly looming as a huge, huge, 
uh, carousel drama in terms of uh, where Dan Mullen's going, but also Notre Dame and Miami both being in the market for offensive coordinators at the same time. That is that is a fascinating little plot twist created by uh, Nick Saban pulling in Tommy Rees uh, uh, and, and bringing him to Tuscaloosa. That's going to be very interesting. Yeah, this is not an Alabama show, but uh, Nick Saban had to um, replace both coordinators and made choices that uh, most people would not consider, maybe not necessarily bad choices, but not the first choice for a program that you would think had its pick at the litter. I know most Bama fans wanted Jeremy Pruitt back, regardless of his issues with Tennessee. Obviously, he would not be in a position running a program. He's coordinating a defense, and he's considered one of the best and Tommy Reese was a curious hire not that he will not turn into a tremendous coordinator who obviously is going to get his hands on better talent at Alabama and certainly better quarterback play you would think although they have all sorts of question marks and uh, unknown commodities for this particular season but of course that Alabama offense has been operating with the likes of Mac Jones, Bryce Young and Tua Tagovailoa for the last 4 or 5 6 years and even Jalen Hurts before that versus uh, the likes of Ian Book, Drew Pine, Tyler Buckner, Jack Cohn, etc. So we will see what Tommy Reese can do with, uh, again, he's got to work out the quarterback situation. We'll see what happens there. Uh, in talking about Alex Grinch, I mentioned to Matt before we came on, and he's well aware of the situation at Iowa where offensive coordinator Brian Ferentz was given a contract adjustment. Was that the term that was used i think so uh not an extension an adjustment so bottom line here i believe they reduced his salary by maybe a hundred thousand dollars or something yeah, like small. that per season a small reduction but gave incentive to earning back and maybe even more than the original salary if he meets two criteria one and this is coming from the offensive coordinator 25 points scoring per game Average of 25 points per game, which I immediately looked that up. I knew it would be middling in college football. 85th, it would have been tied with Arkansas State. 85th in the nation this past season. And then also, and, and let's, the caveat there is that unlike probably any other defense in existence, you can almost count on the Iowa defense scoring. I looked it up again. They, they led the nation. They tied for the lead in most touchdowns scored. This year, as they almost always do. So they will contribute, uh, plus positioning the offense in a good place. So he's going to get all the help from the defense and special teams that you can imagine on top of that. And then the 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 other one is even more curious, that he gets a bonus for seven wins. Uh, I ex I, It's like giving me a bonus for eating oatmeal every morning. I place Iowa football in a higher, but maybe I shouldn't. I, I thought they were better than that. Seven and five is, a, is, is worth a bonus. Yeah. The, the, the hilar I mean, the 25 points per game average, that's hilarious. I, you know, if they said 25 points per big 10 game, now that's something I'd take a lot more seriously, but like, just imagine this. I was going to be leading Western Michigan by 20, 25 points in the fourth quarter. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be getting the ball. Yeah, that They're going to be getting the ball down the field to score their 49th, 56th, 63rd point. Then Ferenc just has to average like 15 points per game in the Big Ten schedule. And he'll meet that. He'll meet that incentive. Like, come on. Come on. How like the, the, the 25 per game over 12, you know, with two uh you know, non-conference cupcakes plus uh, Iowa State. Come on, come on. I mean, if, if this was a Big Ten average per game, all right, that would you know, like that would be serious. Like that would be an actual achievement. But you know, if Iowa scores fifty-six against Western Michigan and uh, and uh, forty-five against Utah State, then you know th that that incentive just means very very little. Uh, and and really, I. I it's really staggering that a, a a set of incentives could be drawn up that poorly. Uh, it really it really is staggering. I mean, the the seven wins, like okay, yeah, why are you settling for that? But really, like every like 
I always set up a situation where everyone's going to be talking about this for the next eight months. It's the only thing people are going to be talking about relative to Iowa football. And then if the offense just goes crazy against the non-con uh, and the non-Iowa State uh, games in the early part of the schedule, then we're going to have a situation where I will just have to average like basically two touchdowns a game uh, in the Big Ten or or five field goals, Clint Moses. Yeah, just five field goals a game is going to get friends uh, to that incentive, uh, to that benchmark. Uh, I, I, it's staggering just how dumb uh, th- this all is. But it's it's the only thing people are going to be talking about in Iowa City. This is Iowa scoring last year. And for anybody out there, and I, I have not seen any complaints, but I typically do if we venture off into other topics, regardless of what the team channel show is. But uh, just keep in mind, we exhaust all the USC uh, but I love getting Matt's uh, perspective on the, the, the other issues and, and teams in college football. Uh, we can always bring it back to USC if you guys have comments or questions. Here's Iowa's scoring in 2022. The infamous seven points against South Dakota State in the opener, in which they did not score a touchdown. They scored the seven points with two safeties and a field goal with the scoring drive of five yards to kick the field goal. So basically you might as well say, yeah, when I looked that up, I thought, okay, this is the most ridiculous thing I've seen. They just won seven to three with two safeties and a field goal. And then I looked up the field goal drive five yards. So the defense scored seven points. Unbelievable. Against and that should be factored into, by the way, that should be factored into defense points per game, offense points per game there that like the metrics for that should be revised. They haven't been, but they should be. Iowa State, guess what? They lost 10 to 7. Their defense scored a touchdown. <laughs> they beat Nevada 27 to nothing. So that sounds like a, a respectable scoring. It's really not 27 points. Nevada was one of the worst teams in the country. This is a great one, too. They beat Rutgers 27 to 10. Two pick sixes. <laughs> They outscored the offense again. This this just doesn't happen anywhere else in football. It's unbelievable. They yeah. scored 14 against Michigan. They scored six against Illinois. They lost nine to six. Their poor defense. They lost nine to six. Their defense gave up three field goals, lost the game. The this was the best 54 point defensive effort I've ever seen in my life. They they got drubbed by Ohio State 54 to 10, but they had six turnovers on offense, and the defense really didn't play that poorly. So they scored 10 against Ohio State. That was a pick six. Yes. Uh they shot through the middle, tipped a pass from CJ Stroud, picked it off. So again, they scored 10 against Ohio State. That was a pick six. They scored 33 on Northwestern. I think it was somewhat of a legit 33. They scored 24 against Purdue. The offense got rolling here. That was a, that was a legit 24 points. 24 against Wisconsin. Then they finished the season 13 against Minnesota, 17 against Nebraska, and classic Iowa effort in the bowl win against Kentucky. They won 21 nothing. They had about 130 yards of total offense, and they had two pick sixes in the bowl game. This is unheard. This doesn't happen anywhere else. I'm just fascinated by this. <laughs> oh, if you have USC's offense and Iowa's defense, that is the number one team in college football. It's definitely better than anything Kirby Smart or Nick Saban uh, could possibly hope to put on the field. And yet, you know, both the USC offense and much more so the Iowa defense, you know, their efforts were wasted in 2022. Uh, you know, in terms of not being able to win the Cotton Bowl, not being able to win the, the Pac-12 title, and Iowa not being able to win what was a bad uh, Big Ten West uh, just because that that offense uh, w- was such a disaster. Um, there was a question up thread. Uh, here we go. So good question from Gixer Squid. Matt, will Lincoln Riley's coaching strategy change given the return of Caleb Williams coaching a Heisman winner as opposed to a Heisman prospect. I think the key insight, Gixer and other uh, USC fans, uh, into uh, how Lincoln Riley is going to coach, we saw it in the Cotton Bowl uh, against Tulane, that it was pretty clear throughout the second half, the USC, like in the third quarter, USC was running the play clock under 10 in the in early midway through the fourth quarter, uh, when USC led by five, then by 12. 
uh, you know, with like six, seven minutes left, USC was taking the play clock under five seconds. And so Lincoln Riley knew that, you know, the, the defense just needed to be on the field as little as possible. Um, so we're going to see early in the season. And of course, you know, the, the, the schedule is backloaded. So we might not really even get a, a, a true feel for where USC's defense really is. But I mean, the first several games of the season, it's a nice soft on ramp heading into uh, the gauntlet. We you know you have Notre Dame, uh, Utah, Washington, and Oregon, four games in a five week stretch. We're going to learn probably uh, in South Bend in the first half of that game against the Irish. We're going to see, you know, if USC's defense uh, is semi competent. And if it is, you're not really going to see any kind of change from Lincoln Riley. But if it's pretty clear that USC's defense is going to get wiped off the board by Sam Hartman and the rest of the uh, Fighting Irish offense, you are going to see if the scoreboard is relatively even and or, and or if USC has a lead. Obviously, if USC is behind, you know, the, it becomes really difficult to stick to your preferred uh, run pass mix. But if, if the score is even or USC is slightly ahead, but it's also clear that the defense is just not there. Lincoln Riley's going to try and uh, possess the ball. He's going to try and, and tailor his offense to more, more toward ball control, less toward the splash play, uh, because there was a very conscious awareness of that dynamic against Tulane, that it was important to get first downs. It was important to keep the clock running more than getting the big downfield play uh, in the second half of that game. And despite Lincoln Riley's best efforts to squeeze as many seconds out of each play as possible, uh, it still wasn't enough. But there was a there was a definite awareness of I I just got to keep the defense on the sideline as much as possible. So that's going to be the plot point, Gixer, for USC in 2023. It's going to depend on what Lincoln Riley sees from the defense, uh, and, and and that will definitely affect his uh, approach because we saw it in the Cotton Bowl. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a clear awareness on Lincoln Riley's part of just how much of a dumpster fire the defense had become. I can't imagine that this matters, but I'll serve it up for Matt. Graham is asking whether it's good or bad that USC spring break is in the middle of spring practice. Uh, you know, if you're chasing a national championship under Lincoln Riley at USC, I think it's task oriented that, that you are focused on making yourself into a champion and you're not letting uh, certain elements of spring break or spring scheduling get in your way if you really want to prepare like a champion. And of course, you know, we don't really have the Clay Helton narrative in this particular offseason. We had that last offseason, you know, heading into spring ball. It was really about cleansing uh, everything, clearing the deck. Uh, you know, get, getting rid of the old mentality, bringing the new one in. Now in year two, that's that's less of a concern. So like the guys who are here, they are fully Lincoln Riley's guys. Uh, they they and they know what to expect. They know what's being asked of them. So there should be just a lot more clarity in terms of expectations, culture, organization, everything that goes into spring ball and uh, getting this team and particularly the defense. Uh, to a higher standard for 2023. Our next show on our network of channels here at the Voice of College Football, the Hawkeyes live show Tuesday at 4.30 Central Time. Join us over on the Iowa channel. And then, of course, Tim, Tony, Rick, and company Wednesday night, 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific, the Pac-12 live chat show right here on the USC channel, also on the Oregon channel and the main channel as well. And, of course, Matt is uh, in the midst of February frenzy heading toward March Madness. Uh, how is that USC basketball team? It, USC basketball is in a good place. And the big reminder for USC fans who, you know, focus on football, but hey, we do have a basketball season to cover. USC has not put its men's and women's team in the same NCAA tournament since 1997. So that's history that could be made. Uh, both teams are currently on the good side of the bubble. Uh, they both have work to do, but like it's trending in the right direction. So uh, certainly exciting times for USC basketball. And keep in mind that 
USC could have NCAA tournament teams this year. The number one recruit in the country, men and women, is coming into USC basketball next year. Isaiah Collier, a point guard for the men. Juju Watkins, who just scored 60 points in a high school game uh, for the women. Like the, these, these basketball programs are on a definite upward uh, trajectory. So USC just speaks to excellence across the board. Uh, as John Rothstein says, not just a football school. Folks, I realize that uh, because I'm on YouTube, just like you are checking out uh, content, whether that's sports or otherwise, and then I just tend to move on. But now, since I've had channels for a long, long time, I keep in mind, hey, appreciate those folks and the content that they bring. Give the like, try to get the word out. So we are asking you to please uh, contact people that uh, you know that we don't know that uh, don't know that we exist and talk USC football every Monday uh, at uh, 8 o'clock Pacific time. Every Monday at 8 Pacific, get the word out and uh, join us on the Pac-12 live chat show Wednesday at 1030 Eastern, 730 Pacific. And of course, get on over to Trojans Wire and check out Matt's work because if Matt doesn't exist, we don't have a USC show for sure. Matt, appreciate all that you do. Thanks for being here. Great conversation tonight. Thanks very much. And I would invite our uh, readers at Trojans Wire. We're going to reheat. We're going to kind of reintroduce a few Riley Files episodes this week. Why, you ask? Because uh, how Lincoln Riley used Jalen Hurts at Oklahoma, that's going to be worth thinking about in the lead up to Super Bowl 57. So we're going to have some Jalen Hurts specific uh, tie-ins to Lincoln Riley from our Riley Files series. We're going to kind of just reintroduce the Riley Hurts connection this week leading up to Super Bowl 57. We will probably do some more fun stuff in connecting college football and the Super Bowl in particular. We had a live stream on Sunday night, and that was how I uh, introduced the live stream. And that was the topic of the live stream. And you could hear how I ripped off the colleges for every starting quarterback in, in Super Bowl history, something I'm sure Matt could basically do as well. And Matt and I could probably sit here and talk about Super Bowl history for the next 10 hours, I'm sure. Uh, great stuff. Matt, appreciate you being here as always, sir. Thanks a lot. Have a great week, Mark.